Hi, welcome back to my channel. My name is Dina and this is my husband Chris and today he's going to join me and I am going to be asking him some questions about law enforcement, about retirement, our marriage, just so you guys can get to know him a little bit better and it won't be just the Dina show. So we will get to know him. A lot of you already know him from Facebook and other ways that I've shared him throughout the you know last 10 years I guess it's been that we've been on social media. But I figured YouTube would be a good opportunity for you guys to kind of put a face to the stories. So we'll get to know him just a little bit more today. So Christopher, yes. how long have you been retired? Almost two, uh, no, a little more than two years. A little more than two years. And how yeah. long were you on the job? 30 total. Last, uh, my last agency that I retired from, 25. 25, okay. Now when you were getting ready to retire, did you have something in your mind of what you thought retirement was going to be? Oh yeah, yeah. I thought it was going to be just all adventure and fun and happiness. So did you anticipate the emotional side of retirement? I kind of did, um, you know, from having gone to uh, some retirement seminars and things like that. Uh, a couple classes talked about it, but um, I think unless you're in it, just like police work, unless you're in it, you just, you really don't know. So do you think that there was almost like a learning curve with retirement on what maybe what you anticipated it would be and then how it's kind of evolved over the past couple of years. Oh yeah. And there's still, I'm still learning. Um, you know, again, I thought it was going to be all just excitement and adventure and I've really had to guard against just falling into a rut, you know, at home, um, not going to bed until four in the morning and sleeping until noon and then just plopping on the couch and watching Fox news all day things of that nature. So, you know, I've really had to, I mean, we have done a lot of hiking, a lot of biking. We've gone to the lake a bunch of times, kayaking, things like that. So it hasn't been all just, you know, rut. But uh, what I'm saying is you have to guard against it and really be cognizant of it and move through it. Okay. What has been the hardest transition for you to retire from going from always in need, phone always ringing, to now where your time is basically whatever you want it to be? I don't miss the calls, the constant calls. Um, I remember the last couple of years especially were extremely, uh, you know, just filled with all kinds of stress that I never even imagined before. So I remember as I approached Retirement thinking it'd be great to just jettison this phone just be able to leave it in the house and go out front and you know Do some yard work and things like that not have to worry about hey Dina Can you listen up to my phone or for my phone and the chief calls me bring it out? You know this kind of thing and that's been nice. That's been great But it, it's it's been weird too, going from the phone ringing constantly to nothing right. I can't remember the last time my phone rang yeah. and but the biggest thing is honestly I loved being a cop and being the one person that could put themselves between the good and the bad, being that person out there that can render aid however needed, um, I miss that part of it. I really miss the relationships that I had with you know, everybody at work. I made some tremendous friendships and I miss them. I miss the camaraderie, but I don't miss the work. I don't, not at all. So if you could go back and maybe work another 10 years no, or something no, or no no desire uh-uh nope nope you good not gonna do it you good yeah okay all right okay so we're not going to just talk law enforcement because i think that good. that's um that's not all he is he's not just you know law enforcement there's a lot more to him and i'd like for you guys to learn other things about my husband besides that he wore a badge for 30 years so let's ask a couple of questions that are more things that I like. So how long have we been married and how many kids do we have? We are going on 21 years in June, this June. Been together 23 years. And how many kids do we have? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, four. Many? Four. Last yeah. count, we have four. And? A dog. It's our son, Tyler. He's having surgery tomorrow. Yeah, I pretend like I don't like him and that he's like, you know, a disappointment as a son. He's obsessed with him, just like me. He's a good dog. He's a good dog. Okay. Now this question is one of my husband's favorite questions to answer, so I'm going to go ahead and get ready. Here we go. Babe, how did we meet? 
23 years ago. Tell a good story. Do you want the real story or I what we've been story. telling our kids all these years? Tell the real story. Let's put it out there to the internet. Well, we met on the internet. What? Back, yeah, back when it wasn't really the thing to do. It was, it was kind of, I'm not going to say taboo, but it was just unheard of really to meet that way. I don't think we knew anybody really. <laughs> One other couple we knew met that way and they're still together to this day. Yeah. Great marriage and yeah, everything. Yeah. So it does um, work. No, it, it was just weird at the time. So, you know, we kind of shied away from telling, but I mean, it was, we met quickly on the internet, but then quickly transitioned in, into talking on the phone and got to know each other much better uh, on the phone. And then we met for lunch at a restaurant and then more on the phone and things like that. So it, the, the original meetup was on online, but. Which what I thought was so interesting. And when I think back to this story, it wasn't like we met on match or something. We met in a chat room. So the chances of us actually being able to meet some stranger in an AOL chat room. And then 23 years later, we're still together. I think it had something, it was a little bit bigger than just us stumbling across each other on the internet. And maybe in another video, we'll talk about how rough a start it was getting to know each yeah, other. Yeah, good and times. It was, it was hard. It was it rough, was hard. but it was made us better, I think, I overall. Think so too. Yeah. I think so, too. So what would you say was the best thing that I was able to do as a police wife for you that made maybe either your job easier or made your life easier or what have you? What was the best thing? Just taking care of business at home. You know, cops usually... By the time they get done with the shift, and I don't care where you work, you could work in Palm Beach, you know, or you could work in, you know, Detroit. It, it's, you know, yeah, maybe stress is, is a little bit higher in, in some cities as opposed to another, but the fact that you have to constantly just be on during your shift, and again, it, Palm Beach, you know, Beverly Hill, whatever, whatever you think of as a great, nice city, low crime city. You still have to worry about the scumbag that's going to walk up to you while you're sitting in your patrol car typing out your report and blowing your brains out. So, you know, you have to position your car a certain way. You have to type a line, look up, look around, be aware of your surroundings. You're always up. You're always vigilant, you know, and it, it takes a toll in, in an 8 or 12 hour shift that like we worked. So just knowing that Dina was taking care of business at home freed me up to be able to, you know, uh, just do my job without any worries about home life. And, you know, we always we always talked about, um, you know, leaving your personal stuff at home so that you can do your job and it's not a dangerous night or day or whatever, you know, um, but it still leaks over. You know, if, if there's some issues at home, it, it's going to leak over. So that was the, big, the the biggest thing for me was just knowing you had it, you had it handled and... I knew she was doing a, a great job as a mom, and uh, that freed me up. What would you say was the worst thing I did that made it harder for you? Even I mean, it could be like as a new wife, just figuring it out, which I had absolutely no idea, or up until the time you retired, what was something that I probably could have done better or got wrong? Um, maybe you, you didn't understand how much time it, it takes um, away from a family. You know, when we first got together, I was working a lot of off-duty details, extra duty details. And at first, Dina took it as, he doesn't want to be with me. Um, he's always working. He just, and, and I'm thinking, no, I, we've got a young family here. I'm just trying to make, you know, make as much money as possible. And, but you got, mm -hmm. you got pretty You're upset tired. at all the times that, you know, because I, at the time I was working evening shifts. We were only on eight hour shifts. I was working three to 11s. I would get off and I would work you know, until three in the morning at a bar or something like that, uh, working, you know, off duty at the, at the door or something, or on my, on my days off, I would work eight hour details at a college, you know, but we found, we worked, we found ways to work around that. And, you know, she would get off work and come and sit with me in the, in the parking lot. Like it, there was a college I worked in. They just wanted you out in the parking lot, just sitting out there. And so she would come bring me dinner We'd sit in the patrol car, eat dinner together. So we found ways to, to get around, you right. know, not being right. together. Okay. Let's see. What was your favorite part of being a police officer? Well, I'd have to go back to the simply being there for 
you know, to be able to put myself between the good and the bad. Just know, just knowing I had that, that function, you know, mm -hmm. um, and it's going to sound corny. I, I know it is, but you know, that's why I liked working as a beat cop, you know, midnights. And even as I became a supervisor and all that, I like, I preferred midnights, but I liked driving through residential neighborhoods and actually thinking to myself, you know what, everybody here in my beat can sleep soundly because while I'm in here, nobody is going to be breaking into your home. Nobody's going to be stealing your stuff. You know, it, it, as long as, as I'm in here and I can do the best I can to prevent that. Um, or, you know, patrolling my business district and my beat, knowing that, hey, your livelihood is safe because I'm on it. I'm, you know, I'm never going to stop. I'm going to be watching my, you know, my beat. So. What was we the had, worst part? Are we doing non-police questions? When we get there, we'll get okay, there. Okay, go ahead. What was the worst part for you? The worst part? Probably seeing the, the deterioration of the public's respect for law enforcement over the years. Um, when I, you know, when I'm in the, when I was in the academy back in 1991, uh, you know, you'd have the world-weary veterans walking in and saying, oh, who would want to be a cop nowadays? And this was back in 91. You know, you want to be loved, be a fireman, which is true. It's always been true. But it, and I know they felt it back then. These world-weary world veterans felt it, it was the worst time to be a cop back then when I was in the academy. But no, it's never been as bad. And the, the difference is your terror organizations such as Black Lives Matter, Aided by their buddies in the mainstream media, this is where I get up on my soap, my soapbox here. But they've been really good in turning that narrative around to where even Joe and Jane Citizen, who before had our backs in law enforcement and before supported us, are now thinking, you know what? These cops, they're going to be reined in. They're they're killing too many young black males. They're killing too many kids nowadays, and. It's, all, it's because it's it's drummed in their heads 24 hours a day. Even Fox News does, you know, think they're not as bad as the other ones, but it's all it's all the media and their their cohorts uh, in Black Lives Matter. And, you know, we had a situation two years before I retired, a highly controversial police-involved shooting. And that's part of what I was saying, how, you know, the last couple of years was extremely uh, stress stressful. But to see the reaction of the public that before had really had our backs uh, kind of turn on us was, man, it just, it really just took the wind out of my sails. And I know my guys that work for me felt the same way. So. Do you think if the tide hadn't really turned that you might have wanted to work longer or go to another position? Or did that make that easier for you to just, it was... Oh, yeah, that made it easier. But I was done. Yeah. I was done. Okay. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest misconception about law enforcement with the general public? That we're trigger happy. Hmm. That, uh, you know, and, you know, you have the sidewalk attorneys and you have the experts that who have never, ever even walked past a police car, but know exactly what we should have done in any given situation. Hmm. That, that... Excuse my language. That just pisses me off. Right. We've gotten really serious here. We have. We have. So if you were going to give a message to a new wife coming on, her husband just graduated, went through the academy, he's new on the job, what would you say to her? What would be the best way that she could help her brand new just, rookie husband? Yeah, just just support him. And usually when, it, when he first starts, or she, when, when they first start, it's all exciting, and they're going to want to come home and tell you everything. You know, about, be there, listen, ask questions. Um, but as time goes on, I think they're going to start coming home, and it, and it's it's going to be pretty quick. I think it was with me, to where yeah, everything was fine, and they they kind of don't want to talk about it. They're not going to want to talk about it, and of course, every case is different. But maybe give them space when they first get home. Be there for them. I loved the fact that Dina would, you know, after she she stopped working, she would meet me at the door. And the kids would meet me at the door. And nine times out of ten, my stress level was up to here. And I only had literally a three to five minute drive home from the PD 
So it wasn't like I had a half hour or hour to decompress in the car. So I was my stress level was still pretty high when I would get home. So I would hug them and it meant the world to me that they would meet me at the door. But then I would turn to the kids and say, hey, listen, daddy wants to go and just take off his monkey suit. That's why I called my, my uniform. Let me go get dressed and get, go get changed and you know, and I'll come out and I'm all yours, you know? And so, and Dina would know, she would shuffle the kids off and they would, you know, keep doing what they were doing. I could go in the room, shower. I hate the word cause it's kind of, you know, new agey, but decompress and, you know, just come out then and be there for my family. So I, I think, you know, maybe just, again, be there for him or her, know, know when to, Give them their space, though, too, I think. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. So if you had to give a message to somebody like me, a veteran wife whose husband is retired or is getting ready to retire, what would you say? Be there for him. <laughs> I, we were. No, no, I know. Um, wow. Um, maybe I should have looked at these questions first. What would, no, your, what would just, you say to me? What just, would your message be for me? You know what? Be patient because I think... Involving or involved in the whole retirement process, there was a lot of ups and downs, a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions that I didn't anticipate feeling. Like Dina live streamed my retirement uh, ceremony and my speech or whatever you want to call it, and to this day I can't watch it. I don't know why. I, I, I don't, I don't know. So you know, maybe just be flexible and anticipate the ups and downs. Um, that come with the emotions. Like right now, I mean, it's like, again, I don't miss the job. I miss my friends at work, but I don't miss the job itself, but I can't bring myself to watch that video. Mm. And I don't know why. Maybe maybe somebody can analyze me at some point and tell me, but I don't know. Would you want any of our daughters to go into nope. law enforcement? Nope, no, no, uh, no. Just no? No. Still mm -hmm. no? Yeah, no, I'm gonna go with no. But what if that was their dream like it was your dream? Does that change? Maybe to make, maybe to have them go into federal law enforcement, something that's not on the street, you know, running after people over fences, you know, kicking in doors. But I just hope they don't want to go into law enforcement. I just hope they don't. If you could look back, knowing what you know now, the way that your career unfolded, the way the tide kind of turned towards law enforcement, and you were that young kid going through the academy, would you have, if you knew how it was going to play out, would you have still made the same choices? Would you still have gone into it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to make it sound like it was not a great career. It was. My city treated us like gold, and they still treat the cops like gold. My city was a dream to work for. Whatever the cops needed, we got. Our chief was top of the line. Uh, he's actually moved up in the city government now. And uh, my bosses, you know, I worked for an assistant chief, uh, two different assistant chiefs at two different times, but I, I can't say, I mean, it was, you know, there were, there were times when I, I hated this place, especially as a patrol officer. I was young and stupid and, I knew better than the administration, but overall, I I was so blessed to have the you know the career I had. It was just a great place to work. It really was. And by and large, the residents, you know, because I worked mainly in the city that employed me, but I was also uh, loaned out to a few different task forces where I worked some of the worst places in Palm Beach County. And people here at Palm Beach, they think. How bad could Palm Beach be? Palm Beach County. I'm talking about West Palm Beach, Riviera Beach. Look those places up if you don't know about them. You know, at different times they had the highest per capita murder rate in the country. Um, you know, drugs all over the place and things like that. So what I'm saying is I experienced police work in both of those areas. My beautiful city, which still had its, you know, crime areas, but also some really bad areas. And... To see the difference in how the residents treated cops, you know what I mean, uh, was striking. So, I, I, I you know, I got to give it to the residents of, of my city as well. They really supported us. Okay. 
What was the single worst day on the job that affected our marriage for you? It had to be, uh, why'd you do this to me? It had to be when one of my guys committed suicide. Um, still affects me to this day. It happened uh, many years ago. Um, probably about six or seven years ago. Maybe five, I don't know. But uh, committed suicide. He lived just outside our city limits. Kind of in, within our city, but in a county pocket. Went home for lunch, you know, in uniform and uh, shot himself, committed suicide. And uh, you wonder what you missed. You know, I mean, I, I didn't have a lot of interaction with him. Um, you know, I was a commander. He was an officer. There was a few layers between us. So I didn't have a lot of inter interaction with him, but <clears throat> still felt guilty about it. And, you know, maybe what I, what I could have done, what we could have caught, you know. But thank God, over the years as a boss, I never had one of my officers severely injured by a bad guy. So, and I thank God for that every day because that was really one of my nightmares. And, uh, but still to see one of your guys in uniform in that condition uh, affected me greatly. And <clears throat> it did, it had a, an effect when I, you know, in our home life, thankfully not, not too bad or for too long but she kind of had to help me through that. That was the worst. <clears throat> go on, go on, another question. Okay. What was, let's, let's, let's turn it, let's turn it. So what was... Please do. Please do. Yeah. Best day. Beside retirement? You mean like best... Case or something that you did that, that you really felt like, you know what, this was it. This was why I did it. Well, there's a few. Um... I think one that jumps to mind is this this single mom of three kids. Um, I won't say dirt poor, but she she didn't have any money, and she was trying to make some extra money as a um, Avon rep, I think it was something mm -hmm. like that. So she had a magnetic sign on her car with her phone number, cell phone number, and all that. But you know, call me for makeup or whatever they do. So. And she had uh, she, she had a little boy who was severely disabled, uh, blind, and he couldn't walk. And he was a probably about four or five, and it was just it was it was so sad to see. And he was such a sweet little kid. But um, and then another kid she had to care for. Dad was MIA, whatever. So she was working like three different jobs to try to you know raise these kids. And they got out at a grocery store, uh, this lady and her older, her oldest kid, which was, uh, I think she was like only like 13 or 14. Uh, and these two guys in another car, they saw the kid and they ended up calling this woman, blocking their phone number on their cell phone, calling this woman and saying the most vile, disgusting things you could ever imagine to her, uh, leaving her voicemail, you know, uh, after she stopped, you know, after she uh, stopped answering the calls, and then finally she blocked them, but threatening this little girl. We're going to find out where you live. We're going to take your girl. You know, we're going to, you wouldn't believe the things that they were saying they were going to do to this poor kid. The mom was beside herself. So, um, uh, it was really all one guy. He had another guy in the car with him, but it was one, one guy that was doing all this stuff. And through our de detective division, I was running, I was a, a supervisor in the TAC unit at the time. So our job, once detectives developed a, a suspect or whatever, was to go out and just scoop somebody up for him, wherever it may be, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, but this, this time I helped, my, the detective was one of my best friends, so he grabbed me and a couple of my guys and he said, hey, can you sit on this guy's house? I'm waiting for him to come home so I can interview him. I said, sure. As soon as we found out what it was about. So we sat, sat up in the neighborhood. The guy came home and we jumped out and confronted him in his driveway. And I won't go into all the legalities. There was a motion to suppress about how we did it, but we came out fine. And the guy ended up getting convicted. But uh, he was a career felon. So... 
the, and I helped the detective actually, for some reason the guy took to me. You know, I, I played the nice guy with him and I got him to confess to what he had done. So we were able to charge him with uh, several felonies related to what he did. And he went away for, uh, he's still away. He's still in jail, uh, in prison because of what his background was and things like that. But to be able to go back to that lady's apartment and see the, the relief on her face. Um, and then she could tell her daughter, you don't have to worry. He's never, he's never going to bother you again. You know, just to get that kind of um, outcome for her and to be able to, you know, let them know that they were safe. And I told her, I said, look, we're going to be patrolling your, your street a lot. We're going to watch your house anyway. We ended up getting like toys for her and her kid, you know, or presents for her and her kids for Christmas, you know, a few Christmases, Thanksgivings, things like that. You know, we got some money together for the, for the lady. That was somebody who was definitely in need. It, it wasn't her fault that her scumbag husband took off on her and she tried to do the best she could with what she had. So that's what cops do. Cops do that kind of thing every day all over this country. You never hear about that except in rare cases, okay? They do that a million times a day as opposed to how many that cops shoot because they have to, you know what I mean? But that that's probably my favorite thing that pops out. You know, and I, I've been involved in shootings. I've been involved in how many car chases, things like that. But that's the kind of thing that sticks out to me. Was good. Is that long and drawn out? It's okay. We'll edit it. We'll edit, we'll edit all We'll do it in post. Yeah. Okay. So that, we're going to go ahead and conclude today. He'll be back, probably not all the time, not every week, but I'll get him back on the camera and we'll ask that him It was all police work, wasn't it? We had a couple that weren't police. I feel, you know, I feel like I was on, like I did when I would be on the stand in a trial. Oh, it's over? Okay. It's Last over. question's over. Thank, thank goodness. All right, it's over. So I'm so, coming off the stand. Am I free to go, Your Honor? Not yet. If you like this video, please go ahead and like it, subscribe, come back next week. We'll have another video. And we will, um, we'll get him back on camera again. We will.